You quit because you thought this plan was not Brexit and was therefore unworkable. It appears most people on all sides uh, have come to the same viewpoint about this plan. So the plan appears to be dead on arrival. Last night, it appeared Theresa May's government might now be dead on arrival. Can she survive this? Oh, yes, I think she can survive it. But I agree with... Uh, the synopsis of the deal. I think it is flawed. Um, I fought very hard to try and get into a place where I could uh, defend it and present it to the country in good faith. I didn't feel in the end, given the late concessions, that was possible. We give away too much control over our laws. We lose the opportunities of Brexit, including the ability to strike free trade deals in practice. Um, and we'd be paying up 39 billion uh, for the privilege. In terms of what happens next, I think we need to take it one step at a time. Next week, early next week, the House of Commons will vote on this. And I think there is an opportunity for the Prime Minister to say, OK, I've listened to Parliament. We need to have some listening to Parliament and uh, the views that have been expressed and go back to Brussels, try to remedy the defects, but ultimately make clear we're willing to walk away. And I if think... you speak to the, the few who back this plan, they say the framework is there, we've got a close economic relationship, we can still strike trade deals, we're out of the common agricultural policy, we're out of the common fisheries policy, and she's achieved her red line which is the end of freedom of movement. It, she is obliged to deliver Brexit. And it might not be your perfect Brexit, but it's getting us out of the EU. I think that's a heroic presentation of the case. Um, and I certainly got huge respect for the Prime Minister's stoicism and fortitude, but we just haven't been tough enough early enough. And if you look at, for example, the one thing people are talking about, the backstop, and for your viewers, it means we'll be locked into a, an EU-imposed regime. We'll have no say over the laws from customs and matters affecting the economy to tax policy and no way to exit it. And that will then be a precursor to the future relationship which will build on that. That's fundamentally undemocratic. And just to pick up on your point about free trade deals, in practice there's no way if we sign up to this regime we'd be able to have an independent trade policy. And that's important because I think free trade is the way to create the jobs of the future, cut the cost of living for low and middle income families. Uh, we've had two Brexiteers now trying to be Brexit secretary and getting nowhere because the boss is a Remainer and she remains a Remainer uh, and she remains in the job. The, the person driving the Brexit train does not want to end up at the destination that Brexit's supposed to be going to. And that's always seemed to me a fundamental flaw here. Given that the government last night was basically teetering on complete collapse, you know, when you lose three votes in rapid succession, when so many of your own MPs are turning on you, mm -hmm. surely the decent thing now the right thing is not to be resilient, which actually is just another word for stubborn, but actually to fall on your political sword and allow a Brexiteer to now take charge of delivering Brexit for this country. I think it's not as simple as uh, leave and remain anymore because we are all Democrats and every Conservative certainly and indeed it's true of the Labour Party uh, and, and Labour MPs went into the last election saying very clearly we were going to deliver on the referendum, we're going to leave the EU. We said very clearly we would leave the customs union in the single market. So yes we need resolve and will. I think that is crucially important. How can you carry on personally backing her and not back somebody who actually believes in a cleaner, harder Brexit. Well, I didn't use the words betrayal or lying or anything like that. And no, I, try I didn't and say you use them, no, but no, that's but what sort of you're in... suggesting by saying well, that, this, try... that this agreement doesn't deliver on the things that she says it delivers on. No, I understand, but I'm going to choose my words very carefully because I like to play the ball, not the man or the woman. And I think what we need now is will. Um, I think there will be an opportunity after the meaningful vote, if it's defeated, as we expect it will be, for the Prime Minister to say, I've listened to Parliament and go back into bat. If you look at after the Salzburg summit and in various points during her premiership, this Prime Minister has showed real mettle. It is time for that. But what I do agree with you is that we need to show the political leadership and the political will to go back and say, we're not going to be bullied and bossed around by Brussels in this, with this blackmail of a deal, frankly. We're not just going to wallow in the risks of Brexit, we're going to grasp the opportunities, and fundamentally, we're going to keep our promises to the public. But the sort of hard Brexit option 
last night all but disappeared, didn't it? There'll be all sorts of motions passed, but they're not legally binding on the government. So we come back to the original point, which I think you rightly made, that this is about political will and leadership from the, the very top. And I think the right course of action to do if this deal is voted down, for the Prime Minister to have listened, go back to Brussels, make a best final offer, but be very clear that we will be willing to walk away because Parliament and every MP has said that they will give effect to the referendum. But Dominic, you talked about leadership there, right? We know, you know, I know, Theresa May is not a strong leader. She's had her chance. She's been faffing around for the last year. I read a column a year ago saying she should go now, a year ago, because she'll end up with a gigantic fudge on this that won't please anybody and will actually create even more division. That's exactly what's happened. I take no pride in being Mystic Morgan about all this, but I could see it coming because after the election campaign, you could see, actually, Theresa May was not a strong leader. Why are so many Tories right now given this utter turmoil, given what happened last Historic night. Why are yesterday. you still persisting in this ridiculous public position that she's the only person that can lead the country at this time? Why don't you all grow a pair and put one of yourselves in charge and actually deliver the Brexit you keep banging on that you want? <laughs> one I of you, do something. I think the public would regard it as political parlour games for us to be engaging in a lot of that shenanigans rather than just focusing on the deal. I also think the Prime Minister's got every right, and this is one of the reasons I stepped down, to present her deal. But the problem is the amount of support that it will have amongst her own colleagues, but also uh, in the House and with the public at large. So I think she's got that right, and, 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 and I want her to be successful as a Prime Minister, right. but also successful but at purely delivering hypothetically, are you Are you a straight talker, would you say? Uh, yes. Do you, do you believe in giving straight answers to straight, simple questions? Yes, but do I don't believe in being drawn into no equivocation. Questions. You either do or you don't. You can't, you can't answer that particular question with a long answer. I think I can. Do you believe in giving a straight answer to a straight, simple question? Particularly if it comes from a straight-talking uh, question like you, Piers. Yes. So do, so do you, yes or no? Yes. OK. So, should there be a leadership contest, and many think there will be in the next few weeks, will you be putting your hat in the ring? And as I've always said, including to you, I don't get sucked into any of those political parlour games or uh, speculation right now. Why? This is the straight answer, the straight question, because the number one top and overriding priority is delivering Brexit. And we've got enough on our plate here, I think your viewers will understand, if I don't get drawn in to what will be perceived by many as those political games. In the Second World War, we could have had Neville Chamberlain reading the country, running the country, couldn't we? But we ended up with Winston Churchill. Thank God, yes. Yes, exactly. So sometimes a strong leader actually can make all the difference. And we are in what many people believe to be the most perilous time that this country's had since the Second World War, certainly uncharted waters politically. Why would there not be a will to get rid of what people think and assume, many people, in Theresa May, we have a Neville Chamberlain type appeaser, appeasing to the EU, appeasing to remain, appeasing to Brexit, why would you not want a more Churchillian figure? Well, first of all, I don't really like the comparisons between Brexit and wars. I think it's demeaning to those that lost their life in the Second and First World Wars and also misunderstands the nature and the character of our of our challenge today, which is large, but nowhere near the Do you think the, this the is the most... Of... OK, well, let me, clarify. Kind of let me clarify. Let me clarify. I'm not though. comparing war with Brexit. What I'm saying is, do you dispute this is the biggest political crisis this country has faced since World War II? Yes or no? I'm not sure. Could, could the Falklands be on the same uh, par? Uh, we had uh, Brexit-type uh, issues over Maastricht. What I do accept, it is a groundbreaking, historic moment for our country. And I think the number one thing we should stay focused on is the crucial decision Parliament will make next Tuesday. And forgive me if all my energies and all my focus are not based on the question that I think the country and the people will expect us to answer, which is, is this deal on the table good for the United Kingdom? And for me, when I think of my children, I think of our long-term future, I just think it would be debilitating economically uh, and create that incendiary cleavage with public trust that your correspondent would talked you like about. To be, would you like to be leader of the party one day? Oh, ambition never, ambition I, I, is no bad thing. I've never ruled it out, but what I don't want to do is get sucked into all that speculation, A, out of um, a respect for the Prime Minister, who I continue to support, and B, because I think it's a political distraction from the, the massive decision that we've got next Tuesday. What is the tweak 
that the Prime Minister could go to the EU if she's defeated, as she's likely to be, on this agreement. What is the tweak that would persuade you that this is a good deal? I think the bare minimum would be an ability to exit the backstop so we're not locked into a regime of laws we've got no control over and no ability to exit. And secondly, I think we need to be very clear on the future relationship that we go into a free trading uh, arrangement, perhaps with um, extra checks, uh, to, uh, extra um, mechanisms to keep friction at the border down, but not in what is effectively a hybrid of the customs union single market relationship. And which if she means... can't get it, if she can't get that, should she resign then? Well, I certainly think we need to be willing to walk away from Brussels and not tremble at the feet to the EU, but actually stand tall in the world. And when you say walk, walk away, you mean go to no deal? I think, we, so I think we ultimately have to be willing to say, I'm sorry, these terms are so bad, this is blackmail, we're not going to accept them. And I think we'd need to be willing to see that through. And if we were, I think we would, over the short to medium term, be far more likely to get a rational, uh, pragmatic response from the right, EU. Right, but because the two options in that eventuality would be to crash out on no deal and move to WTO <laughs> regulations or, or to have a second referendum as momentum is now gathering for, in which, as Tony Blair said on this programme on Monday, you might have an option of a hard Brexit or staying in the European Union. I mean, those are the options. So which one do you think we should be doing if Theresa May fails to get the kind of concessions that you're talking about, which I don't think the EU would give us in a million years? So on the presumption that she doesn't get them, which is the route we take? Well, there are actually points along the spectrum. So I think one thing we could do with it, you say, is, OK, we're leaving at the end of March next year. Uh, if you're not going to accept our very reasonable common sense compromises, we'll let's put in, a, in place some arrangements to at least mitigate the damage that will be done to you, your, European jobs, European livelihoods, but also um, UK business. And if we had that sensible, pragmatic approach, we'd leave the EU, we would mitigate or manage uh, the lion's share of the risks that there undoubtedly will be if we leave with no deal. But they are manageable. This isn't Dunkirk, let's have some perspective here. And I think from the outside of the EU, we'd be in a better position, a stronger position, to have a sensible uh, negotiation, more as equals and less with this sort of bullying approach that we've had of late. Do you think you'll be sending a Christmas card to your great friend Theresa May to Chequers, to Number 10 Downing Street, or to a private address? In her uh, constituency. Number, to Number 10 Downing in, back Street. Back in her constituency. <laughs> to Number 10 Downing Street. You sure? I'm not sure of anything right now, but uh, oh. a balanced assessment of the risk there's, suggests that... There's that the wobble I've been waiting for, Mr Rubb. There's the wobble. If, if that None makes of sure us more are than sure, it, are it, are it, are it is, I'm, I'm, <laughs> it warms my cockles.